Hello everyone, my name is Elie Huerta. I am the director of the Center for AI Innovation at NCSA. And today I am pleased to uh, introduce John Cosifi, uh, who's going to be given today's uh, AI seminar series. Uh, John is a senior research scientist at NVIDIA. and His current focus is on tensor methods for machine learning, particularly efficient combination of these methods with deep learning to develop better models that are memory and computation efficient, while being more robust to noise, random or adversarial, as well as domain shift. He is a creator of TensorLink, a high level API for tensor methods and deep tensorized neural networks in Python. And he designed them to make tensor learning simple and accessible. He has also worked extensively on face analysis and facial effect estimation in naturalistic conditions, a field that bridges the gap between computer vision and machine learning. Prior to joining NVIDIA, John worked at the Samsung AI Center in Cambridge, and he received his PhD and MSc from Imperial College London, where he worked with Professor Maya Pantic. He also holds a French engineering diploma, MSc in Applied Mathematics, Computing and Finance, and obtained a BSc in Advanced Mathematics in parallel. So we are very pleased to have you here, John. So please take it away. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction and thank you all for joining. So yeah, today I will be talking about tensor methods and particularly how we can use them for better deep learning. So in case I don't yet have your attention, and in case you're not already excited about tensors, let me tell you about fantastic tensors and where to find them. So on the agenda, I will first talk about tensors and explain what they are and why we should care. Then I will give a brief primer on tensor decompositions before moving on to leveraging tensor methods within deep learning to design better models. And finally, I'll cover practical implementation with the Tensorly library. So first of all, what are tensors? I think we're all familiar with scalars, vectors, and matrices. And so essentially, tensors generalize the concept of matrices to more than two dimensions. So for all purposes of this talk, by tensors, I mean multidimensional arrays. And typically, the mode of a tensor means it's uh, the order of a tensor, sorry, means its number of dimension and a mode designs one of the, those dimensions. So for instance, a vector is a first order tensor, a matrix is a second order tensor, and so on and so forth. So typically you would use first order tensors or vectors to represent things like time series. If you have feature matrices in regular machine learning, um, you would typically represent these as second order tensors or matrices, where each row would, for example, represent one of your samples and in general, uh, most of the data we manipulate in modern deep learning is multidimensional. So think, for example, spatiotemporal data, MRI, functional MRI, deep neural network features, LIDAR data, etc. And so this kind of multidimensional data is not only omnipresent in modern ML, it also has a lot of spatiotemporal and topological structure. So for example, if you're learning from video, leveraging the temporal correlations is crucial for good learning. Similarly, if you're learning from, let's say, MRI data, the structure is crucial. And so tensor methods give us a way to leverage the structure. So Charles von Lutz said a few years ago that tensors is the next big thing, as he was highlighting that there was a shift in the level of thinking across the year from matrix linear algebraic methods to tensor methods. And essentially tensor methods are a great way to infuse prior in the learning process. And the things we hope to gain by combining tensor methods and deep learning are mostly fourfold. First, compression and with large reduction in the number of parameters, but also computational speed ups through more efficient operations, improved performance and generalization through better inductive biases, and also better robustness, whether that's in the face of noise, random ad ad adversarial, and to domain shift. So now let's see in practice how we can obtain this gain. So I first will give a quick introduction to tensor decomposition, and then we'll see how we can leverage this. <clears throat> 
So in the matrix case, we're all familiar with the concept of matrix with matrix and matrix with vector product. So if we're contracting a matrix with a vector, we're essentially taking a linear combination of the columns or the rows of the matrix. So we can generalize this concept to um, higher order tensors. So here, for example, we have a third order tensor and we are contracting it with a vector. So we're contracting over a dimension, the result is a matrix. And uh, so typically when we contract a tensor with a matrix or a vector, this is called the n-mode product. And why the end? Well, while with the matrix case, we can multiply on the right or the left, tensors in general have more than two dimensions. And so we need to specify on which dimension, along which dimension we want to contract. And so naturally we can contract a tensor with more than one vector or matrix. So here we're contracting a third order tensor with two vectors. We contract over two dimensions. So the result is a vector. And we're essentially taking a multilinear combination of the fibers, which generalize the concept of columnal rows. So now that we are equipped with this core operation of tensor contraction, we can generalize other operations such as matrix decomposition, for example. So when we're decomposing a matrix, we're essentially expressing it as a low rank matrix. So as a, for example, product of two smaller matrices, and that's equivalent to expressing the original matrix as a sum of rank one matrices. So if I have a rank R matrix, you can express it as a sum of R rank one matrices. And a rank one matrices is nothing else than an outer product of two vectors. So looking at things like this, we can easily generalize this concept to tensors by now expressing an input tensor as a sum of rank one tensors. And so instead of having an outer product of two vectors, we will have an outer product of as many vectors as the order of the tensor. So here we have a third order tensor. So it can be expressed as a sum of rank one tensors. And each rank one tensor is an outer product of three vectors, so one per mode. And like in the matrix case, the number of elements in the sum is typically called the rank of the decomposition. And so this decomposition, this particular decomposition, is called the CP decomposition or canonical polyadic. So there are other types of decomposition. For instance, the Tucker decomposition is quite popular and very used. It's also called the higher order SVD. And the reason is that it actually cannot generalize the concept of SVD to higher order. So you take a source tensor and you express it as a smaller core. So that would be your S in SVD if you express a matrix as USB. And you can think of this core as spanning a latent subspace akin to PCA in the matrix case. And then you have a set of factors, one per dimension or mode, which are typically autonormal and which project to and from that subspace and back to the original tensor. And so here, the dimensionality of the, of the core tensor is typically called the rank of the Tucker decomposition. And finally, I just wanna mention the tensor train decomposition. So if you're coming from a physics background, you might know it as the matrix product state it was popularized in uh, machine learning by Ivan Oslodet as the tensor train. And the idea there is to take a tensor and express it as a series of third order core tensors, which are sequentially contracted with each other. So they kind of form a train of tensors, hence the name. So you have one of these core tensors for each uh, mode of the input tensor for each dimension. And you also have boundary conditions, which uh, say that the first rank is equal to the last one and is equal to one. So you can reconstruct the correct shapes. You can get rid of this boundary condition with things like tensor ring, where you would contract the first core with the last one. So this is an overview of a broad overview of the tensor decompositions. Um, one issue with the tensor methods is that these fundamental operations are not always available in Python. And so that's why we introduced Tensorly, which is a high level API for tensor methods in Python. And the goal is to really democratize tensors. So it's an open source library with a large community of contributors. Um, here are the core contributors. And the idea is that we provide a flexible backend system that kind of abstracts away um, the actual backends. So if you write code with Tensorly, you can run it transparently with 
any of the backends, including NumPy, PyTorch, TensorFlow, et cetera. And on top of this um, unified backend, we provide core tensor operations, such as the NMode product I just presented, and tensor decomposition and regressions. So we provide, for instance, CP decomposition with various optimization methods, non-negative decompositions, et cetera. And so just to give a brief overview, for example, if you want to do the tensor with vector product I just mentioned, we can here create a random tensor in a CP form. Um, we just provide the rank of the decomposition. We can reconstruct that tensor. And then we can take the end mode product of a tensor with a vector along any given mode. And similarly, we can easily do tensor decomposition. So here, this is the CP decomposition. We just specify the rank and the type of initial initialization. And then we simply use an API that's similar to scikit-learn. So we fit transform our tensor to get the decomposition. And here we can see that the reconstruction is essentially zero up to machine precision. So now that we are equipped with tensor decomposition, we are ready to apply it to deep neural network by decomposing the parameters of the model. So the first application of tensor methods to deep neural networks was probably by um, Alexander Novikov et al. in a NeurIPS paper in 2015, where they proposed to use tensorization to parameterize the weights of fully connected layers. So there the idea is fully connected layers are parameterized by a matrix. There is no tensor structure. So to obtain this tensor structure, we tensorize the input weight by reshaping it into a higher order tensor. So for example, if the matrix was of size four by um, say nine, we would reshape it in say something of size two by three and two by three. So of course we would want more dimension than this, but this is the core idea. So essentially each mode of the higher order tensor jointly models part of the input and part of the output. So once we have this tensorized weight, we can now express them in a low rank form here in the TT form, and we can then fine tune. And then during inference, we can directly contract the input with the factors of the decomposition. And for optimization, we optimize directly with respect to the weights of the factorization. So this is really efficient for compressing linear layers and creating tensor structure when there isn't really an inherent structure. And so there are cases where the data has inherent topological structure, for example, um, for MRI prediction. And in this context, we want to leverage that structure. So in tradition, oh, don't know what happened there. So yeah, if we look, um, for example, at tensor, um, at the traditional approach, we typically have a um, set of input images and we pass them through a um, series of convolutional layers, nonlinearities, and uh, average poolings, for example. And then we obtain an activation tensor. And this activation tensor is typically flattened and to obtain the and passed on to a series of fully connected layers. And so this series of flattening and fully connected layers typically discards the multilinear structure. So in and so instead, we could preserve the structure using tensor regression layers. And so this is what I'm presenting here. And it's similar to fully connected layers, except this time we don't flatten. And we express the weights of the regression as a higher order but lower rank tensor, which is expressed in factorized form. And so one advantage of this method is that by leveraging the structure, we have much less parameters and we can drastically reduce the number of parameters without hurting performance. So here, for example, this is the classification accuracy obtained with a ResNet 101 on ImageNet. We replace the flattening and fully connected layer with a tensor regression layer. As you can see, there's a large region for which you can reduce the number of parameters without hurting performance. And so, so far we've parameterized, uh, we've showed how to preserve structure. And so that was really useful because the early successes of deep convolutional neural networks on ImageNet were achieved with architectures such as AlexNet or VGG, 
which have a very large number of parameters. So typically 60 million to more than 100 million. And more than 80% of those parameters are located in the fully connected layers. So by compressing these linear layers, we're able to obtain very large compression ratios. However, more recent architectures such as ResNet have most of their parameters in the convolutional layers. So here we're gonna see how we can leverage this structure in the convolutional layers. So just as a quick refresh on convolution, convolutional layers were probably one of the key components to the success of deep neural architectures due to their ability to preserve local structure. And so if you have an input image, you typically convolve it with a feature, with a filter, and you get a feature map. So if you have several channels as inputs, for example, here an RGB image, your filter, we will need one filter for each channel, which results in a 3D kernel. And in practice, we want to learn a bank of filters. So we now have a four dimensional kernel, which will be of size input channels times output channels times height times width. And we can potentially add time to this. So this is a prime candidate to apply tensor decomposition. And there was a lot of study in the literature on doing just this. And so one interesting fact is that if you apply tensor factorization to the kernel of convolutional layers, you not only get mm, large parameter space savings, you also gain an efficient, you also get an efficient way of reparameterizing your original convolution by expressing it as a series of smaller, more efficient convolutions. So here, for example, um, if we apply Tucker decomposition to a convolutional kernel, we can re-express it as something that looks a lot like um, ResNet bottleneck layer. And similarly, from applying CP decomposition to a kernel, we can obtain things like mobile net V1 or V2 building blocks. And so in general, there is a tight link between tensor factorization on the convolutional kernel and efficient convolutional blocks and one can obtain, be obtained from the others. So this is quite interesting because it suggests that we could potentially search over various blocks by instead searching over decompositions and their parameters. And so here, if we look at um, general convolutions um, factorized in the CP form, what's really interesting is that we have essentially disentangled the various dimensions. So we could, for example, train a network on the 2D domain for static prediction on images and apply transduction to generalize to 3D. So in that case, we would add a new factor uh, corresponding to the temporal dynamics and that would allow us to preserve the information we learned on 2D and generalize to the temporal domain. Uh, another useful thing is that this is typically much more efficient. So here, if we look at the number of floating point operations, a float yeah, floating point operations of a regular 3D convolution versus a factorized convolution, we can see that the factorized convolution has much less operation, requires much less operations. So here in green, we have a 3D convolution and in orange and blue, a corresponding factorized convolution with a rank equal to either three times the number of input channels or six times the number of input channels, which are uh, typical parameters. And we can see that they have half or even a quarter of the number of floating point operations. And in addition to this space saving advantages, this can help with performance. So here, for example, I'm showing an application on affect estimation from videos. So the goal is to predict valence and arousal where valence can encode how positive or negative the state of mind of the person is and arousal how exciting or calming the experience. One challenge in this domain is that we have um, annotated images. So we want annotation by experts, but it's very costly to get expert annotations on videos. So as a result, there is much less available data for videos. So what we did is we trained a ResNet with this CP factorized convolution in the 2D domain on the annotated 2D data. And we used transduction to generalize to the video domain. And there, even though we had less domain, we're less data, we we're able to leverage the structure we learned on 2D to perform well. So as you can see, we outperformed previous architectures while having only a fraction of the number of parameters. 
And so conceptually, um, by parametrizing a layer, we essentially leverage redundancies in the parameter tensors. And this redundancy arises as a result of overparametrization, which was shown to be crucial for training deep neural networks by a stochastic gradient descent. So in this way, we would want to leverage redundancies not only within one layer, but across the entire network. And so this is the concept behind the T-net, where we parameterized a whole network with a single weight tensor. So there, each dimension of the parameter tensor models one modality of the network, which allows us to leverage correlation not only across one layer, but across the whole network. And then by applying a low-rank constraint to that tensor, we can regularize the whole model and reduce number of parameters. And so in practice, on tasks like um, body pose estimation and semantic phase segmentation, we're able to get very large compression ratios without any loss of performance. So these tasks are quite adapted to this kind of tensorization because we can make all the convolutional kernels to have the same size because they are kind of unit architectures. And so once we have this concept of T-net, which like a network parameterized by a single tensor, we can apply this to things like domain adaptation, where the goal is to learn a single model on the source domain. And as new data becomes incrementally available for a new task, we want to specialize the model to perform well on this new task but without catastrophic forgetting on the original task. So without loss of performance on the original task. So one way to do this is to parameterize the whole network with a single tensor, as I've mentioned, and then consider, so in, and with the Tucker, apply a Tucker decomposition to that tensor, and then consider the core of this factorization as a shared knowledge subspace. So which is shared across all domains. And then for each new domain, we learn a set of task dependent factors, which are used to project from this shared subspace to the specialized subdomain. So we tested this approach, for example, on the visual decathlon, which consists of 10 data sets. We trained on ImageNet and we tested on things like UCF 101, OmniGlot, et cetera. And we're able to have a model with only 1.35 times number of parameters of the original network that still outperforms previous works in terms of decathlon score and average accuracy. So, so far we have covered a variety of methods to parameterize ten, uh, deep neural network layers with tensor factorization. And we're able using this to get good compression ratios, improvement in performance, but there's another advantage in that now we have a latent subspace spanned by the decomposition in which we can work. So this is useful, for example, to improve robustness to noise. So noise occur naturally during capture, during transmission, but there is also things like adversarial noise, whereby an attacker uh, takes an image and applies a very small amount of noise, typically imperceptible to the human eye. So the result looks the same to us, but this adversarial noise will cause the network to misclassify the input sample with high confidence. So here, for example, that person is holding a printed adversarial example, which causes the model to not recognize him as a person. And so um, one immediate solution to this is to kind of apply some kind of lossy encoding to the input. So one such solution was proposed by Papa Alexakis et al. in the form of tensor shield, where you apply tensor decomposition to your inputs and you reconstruct it and pass this reconstruction to the input network. And that was shown to work well and typically better than, for example, JPG encoding. And going further, we can apply, we can generalize the concept of dropout for tensor factorizations. So the key idea here is that if you apply regular dropout, you're dropping connections. And so that induces sparsity on activation and changes the statistics. By contrast, we could apply dropout on the latent subspace of the decomposition. So for example, for the CP case, we could randomly drop each component before reconstructing the full weights. So here we have a CP factorization of a tensor. So we've expressed our original tensor as a sum of rank one tensors. And now we have an additional weight in the sum so lambda zero to lambda r, and each of these weights is sampled from a Bernoulli distribution. So in other words, we keep or discard each rank one tensor according to this Bernoulli random vector. 
And we can generalize this to other decompositions, such as the tensor dropout here. Um, so instead of having a vector, in this case, we will now have a sketching matrix. And in this case, for Bernoulli dropout, it will be a diagonal matrix, the entries of which will be Bernoulli. And so now the network can no longer rely on any single component to perform the decomposition. And so that acts as a regularization term on the loss that takes into account the lowering structure of the weight. And so this typically results in better performance. So here, for example, we took a ResNet 101, again, uh, replaced flattening and fully connected layers with a tensor regression layer. And we can see that if we apply tensor dropout, performance actually increases thanks to the regularizing effect. And not only this, we can actually robustify the model against noise using this technique. So here we trained, again, a 3D ResNet for predicting the brain age of patients based on their MRI uh, data. And as you can see, if you tr we train a regular ResNet, 3D ResNet with linear uh, output layers, the error increases very quickly if you apply any noise to the input. So here we applied um, normal noise, but Gaussian noise, which was shown to model well the Grishin noise that occur naturally during capture of MRI data. So as you have any noise, the mean absolute error in years here increases very quickly to unacceptable um, values. While just with tensor regression, thanks to the regularizing effect of the low rank factorization, you can inc increase the amount of noise without drastically losing on performance. And if you additionally apply tensor dropout in green here, there's a large region for which you can add noise and not see any loss in performance. And so finally, I just want to cover some practical implementations with Tensorly Torch. So Tensorly Torch is an open source package that we are developing uh, in my team in NVIDIA. And it allows, it provides out of the box tensor layers. So we've actually just um, completely rewritten the library and we're going to release the new version in a couple of days. And the idea is that we build on top of uh, Tensorly and provide convenient PyTorch layers that can be directly used within deep neural networks. So as a case study, I want to show some examples on large scale video classification on the kinetics data set. So the kinetics data set is an interesting one because if you look, for example, at typical data set like UCF 101, uh, in that data set you have 101 actions and 2,500 videos, so it's quite small. By contrast, Kinetics is a large scale data set with more than 300,000 videos of about 10 seconds each, collected from YouTube and annotated in terms of one of, of 400 human action classes, such as playing instrument, hugging, or here, playing cricket. And so it's interesting to have good models trained on um, kinetics because the typical pipelines requires first training on ImageNet, then somehow extending to video, for example, using transduction, and finally, fine tuning on your actual task, where typically you don't have enough data to train from scratch. And so here, we simply started with a pre-trained PyTorch model. We used Tensorly Torch to compress each of the convolutional layers, so you can do this simply by calling on a factorized convolution. Here we use the Tucker factorization and we just fine tune. And as you can see, um, for smaller compression ratios, so up to 20%, we not only reduce the number of parameters of the whole architecture, but we also have some gains in performance. And that's again, due to the low rank constraints. And so we also see this for the top five accuracy. And we can also do this for any kind of architecture. So here we tried it on the ImageNet data set for image classification. So we took a ResNet 152. And so here in red, this is the top one accuracy of the original network. And so if we factorize the network um, using a layer-wise factorization plus the tensor lasso, we get this result. So tensor lasso essentially generalizes the concept of lasso regularization to tensors. So here we add an L1 regularization on the rank of the decomposition, and that allows us to optimize this end-to-end -end and regularize the problem. And in addition, if we do a joint factorization, so similar to the TNet I presented, 
we can we again get a gain in accuracy and we can compress the architecture further so up to about 20 percent compression ratio without any loss of performance and so just to show how you would do this if you're coming from pytorch for example so this is how you create a convolution in pytorch you specify the number of input channels output channels and kernel size and so tensorly torch layers are pytorch layers so you can directly use them in any architecture and so the only difference here is that we specify the order because you can do convolutions of any order. We specify the rank of the factorization parameterizing the layer. So here same means we want the same number of parameters as an uncompressed layer. And we specify the form of the factorized weight. So here we want a CP decomposition, but that could also be Tucker or tensor train. So you can train these from a pre-trained layer by compressing the weight of their existing layer so here, rank equals 0, 0,5 means we want half the parameters. Or you can jointly factorize multiple layer by passing in a list of pre-trained layer or by training from scratch. And so essentially, tensor Torch builds around the concept of factorized tensors. So the core building block is this idea of factorized tensor. So here we're creating a tensor of a third order tensor of size 3 by 4 by 5 with a Tucker form. And you can directly initialize this factorization. So that's quite important in deep neural networks. Initialization is crucial for good learning. So here you can initialize the factors such that the reconstruction, the reconstructed full tensor will have a normal distribution with the specified standard deviation. So you can reconstruct either the full tensor or you can also directly manipulate the factorized tensor. So here we're indexing the factorized tensor and we get as input another smaller factorized tensor. So we provide um, most of the layers I've already presented here and actually some more. So we have tensor regression layers, contract, tensor contraction layers, and the tensorized linear layers. And you can apply uh, things like tensor dropout or tensor lasso to any of these factorized layers. So here, if you create a convolution, you can apply the tensor dropout I presented just by applying this hook, or you can also apply a tensor lasso to automatically determine the rank. So, so far we've seen a wide range of application of tensor methods to deep learning. So there's an exciting application of tensor methods that I also want to mention that is for quantum computation and quantum machine learning simulations. So as you know, quantum computation is a rapidly growing field that seeks to solve essentially difficult problems such as optimization, quantum chemistry or condensed matter simulations due to the naturally large state space and dynamic interactions between states. So as the field is still in its infancy in many ways, it's currently limited to small and noisy devices, which are very expensive to build. And so for this reason, simulations are still key to its development. So the main difference is that while traditional computers operate on bits, the logical unit of these um, quantum computers is the qubit. So while qubits are traditionally expressed in matrix formalism, they can also be naturally expressed in the tensor form, and that's where it's interesting for us. So an example of operation that can be efficiently done in the tensor form is the partial trace over portions of cubic registers, which has deep ties to the study of noise, decoherence, or information metrics. So using tensor methods in quantum computing, we can naturally speed up operations, and we are very interested in exploring decomposed tensors to simulate low rank quantum states. And that's doable because most problems of interest actually lie in a small subspace of the full Hilbert space, so the full quantum state space. And in that case, the problem can be efficiently modeled through tensor factorization. So Taylor Patty, who's currently doing an internship in our team, has been working on extending tensorly for quantum operations. And so here, this graph shows some preliminary results. And we found that by building on top of tensorly and leveraging tensor methods, we're able to compute, for example, partial traces here much more efficiently. So here we have 20 qubits and we're taking a partial trace over 10 of those qubits. And we found that we're able to speed up things from Qtip, which is the leading matrix formalism software by two to 20 X. And we use three to four times less memory. So that's run on, G on CPU. And if now we use GPU, which in Tensorly you can do for free by just switching the backend, those speedups can be between 5x and 500x. So I think that's a very promising direction 
and we're probably going to see a lot more applications there. And so finally, I want to mention just the compute side. So one of the reasons tensors were less used is there is um, kind of a higher learning curve, but they're also they also have less available uh, hardware. So tensors are less expensive to compute in the problem matters, but we need the right primitives. And so just as there was a shift in the level of thinking in math, there was also more an increasing development of tensor blast primitives. And so for example, tensor contraction that in, I introduced at the beginning is kind of central to most of the tensor operations but it should be efficiently implemented to avoid expensive transposes. So naive implementations of tensor methods typically result in many transposes, inefficient data layouts, etc. And so in NVIDIA, we develop QTensor, which is a high performance library for tensor operations and in particular um, tensor contraction. And it is able to do this contraction in a transpose free manner. So you don't suffer penalty by copying memory, et cetera, and it supports a lot of things such as mixed precision, et cetera. So to summarize, um, by using tensor methods, we can design better models by reducing the number of parameters, um, speeding up computation, increasing robustness, and improving generalization through better inductive biases. So as a quick summary, if you, have, if you want to apply tensor methods to your own models, if you have no tensor structure, you can use tensorization to reshape your weight matrix into a higher order tensor and obtain those large compression ratios using tensorized linear layers. If you already have structured weight tensors, then you can directly decompose them and obtain efficient reparameterization. And you can generalize to more dimensions using transduction. For better gain, if you have several layers, you can parameterize jointly several layers to leverage correlation across these layers and get better performance. And if you want to preserve the topological structure throughout your network, you can replace flattening and fully connected layers with tensor regression layers. And you have add-in hooks that you can just add to any of these factorized layer to have a tensor dropout for increasing robustness and tensor lasso to automatically select the rank. So all of these layers are available as PyTorch layers in the Tensorly Torch library. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to try it out if you're interested. So that was all for me and I'd be happy to take questions now. Okay, um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the talk. I'm Lefteris Kofidis from the University of Piraeus in Greece. Uh, in, in fact, I'm, I feel very nostalgic uh, since, uh, you know, it's been 20 years now since I first worked on tensors and now I, I realized that uh, you know this uh, topic was has grown so much now after so many years. Um, I, I, I have uh, two questions which are very much related. Uh, the first one is about this uh, tensor dropout uh, idea you presented, and uh, uh, for example, in the CPD case, you have this uh, lambda uh, coefficients, and you, uh, if I understand correctly, you 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 sampled it, you sampled it from a Bernoulli distribution. So, but this reminds me of uh, of the other thing that you call tensor lasso. Uh, how, uh, uh, but usually, usually you also you also have a regularization of a uh, uh, one norm on lambda to um, um, I mean to to perform the, this dropout. Uh, how does it uh, relate uh, this Bernoulli thing with the uh, L one norm regularization? Yeah, and that's the other question is uh, uh, if you if if I could uh, pose them both of them, uh, uh, it's in terms of lasso. Um, uh, could you show us any publication? And uh, uh, I'm very much interested in this. And uh, I was I'm very interested in fact in how do you tune the regularization parameter. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. These are great questions. Um, so let me try to share again my screen. So let me go to the slide. Yeah, so actually what, yeah, what you said is exactly right. So for the tensor dropout, we already add these um, factors in the sum. So essentially for tensor lasso, we can just apply an L1 regularization there. And so that's, that's quite straightforward. Um, for the Tucker case, it's 
slightly um, more involved that we have to actually add these sketching, we add these sketching matrices. And in this case for tensor lasso, we add an additional sketching matrix with, um, which is diagonal and we apply the L1 loss on this diagonal matrix. And so this can be generalized to things like tensor train, et cetera. So actually, yeah, for the tensor dropout, this is the publication. Um, it was actually just uh, accepted in the journal for special topic in signal processing. Um, and we also show that there is an equivalence between the stochastic problem. So the tensor dropout on tensor factorization and a deterministic problem, which takes into account the low rank factorization. Mm -hmm. And so the second question, I guess, was on how to tune the regularization. And there, yeah, there, there is no, um, no great way to do it. It's essentially, we have to validate it on um, a validation set. And it really depends on how much, so for the, for the tensor dropout, we can go typically to 0 0.6 and that still improves performance. For tensor lasso, it really depends on the amount of sparsity we want to get. So if we want to really reduce the rank, we would increase the regularization and vice versa. Okay, thank you. Any, any publication about tensor lasso? Maybe I could uh, have a look at. Um, not yet. Actually, I don't think that it was done for Tucker and TT decomposition. So we just added it in tensor litosh, but I don't think, I don't know of any publication yet. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any, any comparisons uh, in terms of, um, say, performance or, say, um, uh, convenience of programming, etc. Between tensor Li uh, and uh, other known uh, uh, tensor related toolboxes such as tensor lab, um, is there anything such like that? So yeah. I mean, I mean uh, for somebody for somebody who is especially the, the newcomers, uh, what will be the, the best thing to, uh, to do? Of course, uh, tensor Li is in, in Python, so it's closely connected to the deep learning, but if we exclude this, yeah, so as, as you said, yeah, I think uh, first, yeah, the tensor lab and the, um, I guess it's mostly by Lieben and the last hour. And there's the tensor toolbox by Tamara Kolda mostly, which are really great toolbox. Um, they are only in MATLAB. So that's the reason we also developed Tensorly. So Tensorly focuses yeah, on, on, on Python only. And the other thing is we have this backend system that allows you to run the computation transparently on any of the backends. So that includes PyTorch, and so through Tensorly Torch, we also provide um, deep neural network layers that can be directly used with uh, any deep neural architecture in PyTorch. So I think, yeah, the main, reason, the main difference would be that's in Python and that um, it can be incorporated with the deep neural networks. And for the API, we try to really make it as easy as possible. So for newcomers, you can directly create tensor factorization without really, by using it as a black box, and for advanced users, you can really dig in and set more parameters. We, for example, have now um, non-negative CP decomposition. We have through HALS, uh, multiplicative updates, and a couple other methods. So you can really dig in and try to optimize the parameters depending on your application. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. And yeah, if, if you have any, any question, feel free to email me or contact me. I'd be happy to, to answer. Great, so I guess, yeah, if there's no other question, I guess, um, LU, we can perhaps end the presentation. I'm not sure if LU is still here, but uh, thank you very much, John, for this wonderful talk. And I don't believe we have anything scheduled for next week, but the week after that, I think we should be back on. Great, so. yeah, thanks very much for the invitation and thank you all for joining.